God's survival kit for these last days. How many of you know this is the last days? How many of you know we need to survive these last days? <laughs> Amen. It's dark days we're living in. It's uncertain days we're living in. We do not know what is on the horizon, what is waiting for mankind in the form of war, in the form of diseases, sicknesses, um, and all these uh, natural disasters. We do not know what lies ahead. But if we have the survival kit, amen, we will be able to face any storm that looms over the horizon. If you will take these tools this morning, and if you will use them on a daily basis, not only when calamity strikes, not only when calamity hits, but if you will apply the word daily into your life, I can guarantee you, beloved, that you will stand strong in these last days. Amen? How many of you believe it's the last days? How many of you can see when you look around you, these are the last days? For some of them older folk who come out of the 60s and the 70s uh, and the, maybe the 50s as well, you know that times have never been this crazy as they are today. Amen? The young people can't even look so hard at all the amen saying, because... But we have seen enough to know that it's never been like this before. So much trouble, so much calamity, so much sin being practiced openly and unashamedly. Clearly we know that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is about to return. So we need to prepare ourselves for this return of Jesus. Amen? We need to prepare, beloved, and therefore God has given us... Uh, survival tools survival kit to help us navigate through the journeys of life amen now if you will take this word today i promise and i guarantee you you will never lose your footing in christ it's no use coming to church and hearing a nice sermon and saying wow that was so powerful but you don't apply it into your life you've got to apply it or else it's pointless being here Amen. So today I want you to vow before God. Let your yes be yes before God and say, Lord, from this Sunday on, if I haven't done it previous Sundays, from this Sunday on, I will apply your word into my life on a daily basis. Make that pledge to the Lord this morning. Amen. And in your busy schedule, because life gets hectic. Some of us are mothers, we wives, we fathers, we husbands, we are workers. And not, when we come home from work, we still have to work again. And, you know, so we need to find time, not only for our family, but we need to find time to spend with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life. Purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me, uh, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, that means yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue, Timothy, thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Father, will you help us now to minister your word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Lord, without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do it. We cannot preach it, and neither can we hear it, and neither can we believe it or understand it, and even less apply it. So we need the Holy Spirit to help us. Help me, this preacher with clay lips, to speak thy divine oracles, that your people may hear, even the simplest child, may understand and grasp these wonderful truths from thy word. I pray this in the name of Jesus and may Christ and him crucified be lifted up 
And may this preacher decrease in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, confirm your word this morning with extraordinary supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles according to the Spirit as he wills. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So how are we going to survive in these last days? How are we going to stand firm in these difficult times? In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 9, Paul warned Timothy of the difficult. Uh, another translation says perilous. The King James says perilous. He warned Timothy of the perilous times that would happen throughout church history. People would be lovers of themselves. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They would be abusive, unforgiving, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Paul also warns Timothy that there will be many false teachers that would lead people astray. And just as Paul warned Timothy, Christ warned his disciples as well. In Matthew chapter 13, that Satan would plant tares among the wheat. The church would be full of false converts and full of false doctrine. And because of this reality, many have become angry at God. Let me tell you, people have become angry. Christians who were once believers in Christ, they become angry with God. They become bitter toward the church. And some have even fallen away from Christ altogether. Why? Because of the tears that are being sown among the wheat. Because of the false converts among the true converts. And the Bible says that the wheat and the tears shall grow together. Amen. So we don't know who's sitting here, who are, who's wheat and who's tears. But there's definitely a combination of the two here. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says to Timothy, after giving him the bad news, he says, however, however, Timothy, you, that's verse 10, all right? Verse 10, but you, Timothy, you have known what I have taught you. And he calls Timothy to what? Not only to know, but to what? To continue. He says, continue in what you have learned. Verse 14. Amen? Continue. Don't give up. Don't quit. Continue. Keep on keeping on, Timothy. And Timothy was to be different from those with an empty religion. There are people who have an empty religion. Paul tells Timothy, you need to be different to those who have an empty religion. Timothy was called to what? To continue being faithful even while others went from bad to worse. According to verse 13. In this text, we will see four survival tools in God's survival kit that he has given us for standing firm in these difficult times. Not only do these survival tools apply uh, to difficult seasons in the church, but ultimately it applies to bad times in our lives. We're going to have some bad times, beloved. Amen. Yeah, we're going to have some bad times. The big question, what principles can we discern about surviving these terrible last days from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. What principles can we, can we glean, can we discern from this particular text? Number one, to stand firm and survive in these last days, we must what? We must remember the faithful. Amen? We must remember the faithful. You, what, pastor, what are you talking about? All right, let's see what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. It says, you, however, have followed my teaching. Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you have what? You have followed my teaching. You have what? Somebody talk to me. You have followed my teaching. But what else did you follow? You followed my way of life. You followed my purpose. You followed my faith. You followed my patience you followed my love and my endurance as well as the persecutions and the suffering
things that happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. I endured these persecutions and the Lord delivered me from them all. Paul endured all of this and he's calling Timothy what? To remember the faithful. Paul was what? Faithful. Amen? And Paul says to Timothy, remember everything I went through and I still stood for Christ. Hallelujah. And after sharing with Timothy about the ungodly people and the false teachers, keep that slide up, that one, uh, remember the faithful. Uh, uh, after sharing with Timothy about the ungodly people and the false teachers in the church, which he did from verses 1 to 9, he now encourages Timothy with his example. He says in verse 10, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, though there were dark times and evil people in the church, Paul was faithful. And his faithfulness was meant to encourage Timothy. Similarly, when Elijah was depressed and no longer wanted to live, he cried out to God, am I the only one left? I tell you, every Christian gets to that place. Especially every preacher or every pastor of a church. They get to that place where they ask, am I the only one left? However, God reminded Elijah that he had preserved a remnant that would not bow down to Baal. Praise the Lord. And, and if God did that for Elijah, then God will do that today. And Satan often tempts us to feel alone. Come on somebody. Satan tempts us to feel alone. He tempts us to feel hopeless. But we are not alone. And we are not hopeless. Because God has faithfully preserved his saints throughout the ages. Hallelujah. And even in these dark times, God will do it again. Hallelujah. We need to recognize this in order to stand firm. God will not leave me. He's faithful. He'll keep me through the darkest hour of my life. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. Slide. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9 says, Be sober. Be vigilant. Why must you be sober? That means be on the lookout. Be vigilant. All right? Be on the watch. Watch your back. Watch your sides. Be alert. Be sober-minded. Uh, don't allow the things of the world to cause you to go into a, a spiritual drunken stupor where you're not able to see the enemy when he's, when he's kissing you. He says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, goes around as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And then it says in verse 9, whom you must resist, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren all around the world. You're not alone. Somebody say you're not alone. <laughs> Beloveds, we should resist and stand firm against Satan's attacks. Because we have a family of believers around the world who are enduring suffering as well. Though many in the church possess only a form of Christianity, but no reality in their lives, according to 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, there are many who follow God faithfully. Praise God. There are some who are playing games, and there are some who know they're in a warfare, and they're fighting the good fight of faith. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. We got some soldiers in the church. Amen. Amen. We don't, ah, we got soldiers. There are some people who are serving God faithfully. And they're standing firm no matter what comes their way. They're not giving up. They're not looking to the left. They're not looking to the right. And they're not retreating. They are advancing in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Glory to God for those saints. Glory to God for them. Hallelujah. And if we are going to stand firm and survive these terrible times, we must remember those saints who are faithful to the Lord. Come on. Timothy had Paul. Who do you have? Timothy could look to Paul's life as, as, as an encouragement that no matter what you're going through, you can stand firm in the power of God. Hallelujah. That is what Timothy saw in Paul. And Paul reminded him, remember what I went through, Timothy. 
So when you're going through it as well, young man, just remember God kept me. God kept Elijah. In Hebrews 12 verse 1, the author says something similar to the persecuted Hebrew Christians slide. I think it's the Hebrews 12 1. Therefore, seeing that we are also uh, encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. He says, therefore. You see that word, therefore? Therefore points back to chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. Therefore, he's pointing back to chapter 11, where the author describes many of the heroes of the faith. Amen? Like Abraham, like Noah, like Moses, like David, and others. And he essentially says that remembering them. But he says, therefore, seeing that we are encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Hallelujah. Who are these witnesses? Who's this great cloud of witnesses? It's all the saints that have gone before us. Hallelujah. And he says, you look to them. Draw strength that they made it. They made it through difficult times. Hallelujah. The word endurance. He says here, yeah, remembering these witnesses will help us to get rid of the sin that so easily besets us and to run this race with endurance. And endurance means to bear up under a heavy weight. That's what endurance means. To run the race with endurance or with what? Patience. It means to bear up under a heavy weight. And when we feel like giving up during terrible times in the church or life in general, we must remember the godly examples that have been set for us. In the word of God. Hallelujah. We must remember how that God allowed Joseph to suffer betrayal from his own family, slavery and prison before God exalted him to second in command in Egypt. Come on somebody. We must remember how that God allowed Job to suffer various tragedies but how God's ultimate purpose was to bless him. Come on. Remember the faithful. Somebody say remember the faithful. We need to remember the faithful if we are going to persevere during hard times, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> you need to remember the faithful. We need, to, we need to have someone we can look to and say, he made it, she made it, God kept him, God kept her. If God kept them, if they made it, then I am going to make it. I might have a bit of a stumble and a little of a slip and a bit of a fall, but I'm going to get up again because he promised that he will keep me until the end of the age. Hallelujah. He said, behold, I am with you until the end of the age, church. He's never going to quit on you. Hallelujah. Listen, I like what Jimmy Swaggart said. He says, God can help failures, but he can't help quitters. Mm, that's deep. God can help failures, but he cannot help quitters. So I want to encourage you this morning. You may fail, but don't quit. Because if you fail, he'll help you. But if you quit, he won't. Amen? Beloveds, we must remember the faithful. While we're going through some difficult times. Hebrews 12, 1 explicitly reminds us of the importance of reading the accounts of the Old Testament. Hebrews 11, it tells us about Abram and Noah and, and, and all these uh, saints of the faith of the Old Testament. We must read their stories. We must read it. Amen. I encourage you. And they are not just stories for children. They are for us. They are, they are there to help us overcome the besetting bondage of sin and to persevere in difficult times. Somebody say remember the faithful. But not only do we look at the saints of the Old Testament. But we are encouraged this morning. To look at the faithful around us. That are alive with us today. Amen. Hallelujah. Because sometimes it seems a bit far fetched. 
to, to, to go back into the Old Testament and, 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 and learn from Job and Abraham. But when we look at some of our brothers and sisters in Christ alive today and what they are going through and they're still standing for Jesus and they're not giving up, hallelujah, they might fail and they might fall, but they are still persevering in the power of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. Some of you are sitting here this morning and you know that you should have fallen by the wayside. The devil should have taken you out long ago, but for the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. But for the grace. And some of you ain't even shouting. Some of you are sitting there with arms folded, a mouth full of teeth. I wish you would just at least say hallelujah. I wish you would at least say thank you, Jesus. He kept you through your darkest moments. When you were down deep in depression, in the pit of depression, he took you out of that dark pit, hallelujah. Lifted you above the shadows and placed your feet on the solid rock. Hallelujah. Some of you know what I'm talking about. If you know what I'm talking about, give the Lord and clap a praise. Hallelujah. I remember one night, my wife is my witness. And I think I've shared this once in the church. So I'm sharing it with those who are not yet part of the church that time. But in case you forget, for God this is for you. I was sleeping one night. And I heard a, a, a voice speaking in, in tongues. But I knew this wasn't of God. This wasn't the Holy Spirit. But it was Tongues. And in the tongues, I could hear the interpretation. While this tongues, some language, I don't know, it's demonic. And in this tongues, I'm hearing the, trans, or the, the, the interpretation of those tongues saying, I'm going to take you out. That's what, this, that's what they told me. I'm going to take you out. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ. And boom, it was over. And that could have been about a year and a half, year and year and a half ago. If, if it's not for the grace of God, the devil will take me out. He, he can't take me out. So I'm, I'm looking to Calvary. He can take you out too anytime he wants. But if it's not for the grace of God, hallelujah. If it's not for the grace of God that covers you. The angels of God that surround you. He'll take you out just like that. How many times he tried to take you out, Donnie? Well, since I know you. <laughs> I think about three times. With COVID. And then not too long after that, Brother Donnie was again in hospital. High blood pressure. And and, and there he sits. And, and, and some of you got the same testimony here this morning. Come on. You got the same testimony. You should have been, you should have been gone. But there's a reason why you're here. There's a reason why he kept you here. There's a reason why you're here. There's a reason why you made it through COVID. There's a purpose. And the devil can't take me out and he never will. The only one that can take me out is God. The Bible says in the book of Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Only the Lord is going to take me out. And I pray that he's going to take me out in the rapture. I pray he's going to take me out in the rapture. Hallelujah. That's how I want to be taken out. I don't want to be taken out in some other crazy way. I don't want to be shot. Heart attack. No. I want to be taken out in the rapture, man. Woo. Those who are alive and remain. I want to be part of that group. Not those who are dead in Christ. Thank God for them. But those who are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together with them. To meet the Lord in the air. That's, I want to be part of the alive and the remaining. Amen. So, beloveds, we are also reminded to look at those faithful saints who are around us. We must watch them. Watch the faithful saints around you don't put your eyes on the on the the sluggish and the lazy and the procrastinator saints amen they're going to depress you they're gonna get you down look at those who are 
on the front line of the battle. Come on, somebody. Look at those who are on the front line of the battle line. Come on. Those who are fighting the enemy face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Those who are filled with the zeal of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Those who are working and laboring and toiling day and night and night and day. Hallelujah. These are the men and the women we must look at. And these are the men and the women we must surround ourselves with. Surround yourself with lazy people. You yourself shall become. You surround yourself with stupid people. You yourself shall become. Yeah. You surround yourself with people who don't have vision. You yourself will have no. Amen. I'm not being nasty. I'm just being honest. There are some stupid people in the world. Pastor, that's not kind. Didn't Paul tell the Galatians, oh foolish Galatians. In other words, oh stupid Galatians. Yeah, okay, so settle. Let's move on. That settles that. Let's move on. Right. So, we must look at men and women who maintain their integrity and who maintain their faith during hard times. Come on, did you get that? Look at men and women who maintain their integrity and who maintain their faith during hard times. Those are the men and women I look at. The example will help us to stand. Like Timothy, we need to intimately know. What did Paul tell Timothy? Therefore, you have known. You have known my life. You have known my walk with Christ. You have known my purpose. You must what? No, no other faithful believers so that we can draw strength from them. That's why God gave the church. Hebrews 10, 25, to encourage one another. All the more as we see the day growing nearer. So beloveds, my question, who are you watching? Who are you watching to draw strength from in these times of difficulty? Often in times of difficulty, we tend to focus on the storms of unfortunate circumstances or difficult people, such as myself. <laughs> I'm a difficult person sometimes, which only can further discourage us when we look at such people. However, we need to focus on both, on, on God's faithfulness. Yes, that's one thing. God is faithful, but also we need to what? Focus on his faithful saints. So we can what? Persevere. Application question. Why is it so important to remember the example of faithful men when going through difficult times? Who are the faithful around you that you can watch during the storms of life? I want you to think of some people that you can... You've already earmarked some people that, whose lives you are watching to draw encouragement from. I'm asking you, can you think of anyone right now? Number two, to stand firm and survive in these last days, we must not only remember the faithful, but we must what? Follow the faithful. We must what? You must remember the faithful and you must what? Follow the faithful. Pastor, we're not supposed to follow Jesus. Yes, of course. But we also imitate those who imitate Jesus. Who are closely imitating Jesus. Amen. I look to Pastor Derek Finn. Pastor in Durban who is now 60 years in ministry, who ordained me into pastoral ministry, my wife and I. And I look at this man's life and I say, I want to follow that. I'm so far from it. <laughs> but thank God I might still have another 20 years if Jesus tarries to try and reach that point of that man's character. One of the most humble men I've ever met in the whole world. Pastor Derek Finn. A man who doesn't depend on people to drive him to church. He walks to church at the age of 80, 80 something. And he still walks to church. And walks back. Even when you offer him a lift, he said, no, I'll walk back. It's okay. It's right up the road. What a humble man. He'll sit at the back like me. Sometimes I sit at the back. He doesn't like the front seat. He likes to sit in with the people, with the congregation. What a humble man. And I wish I could spend more physical time with him. So that that can rub off on me. 
I see him two or three times a year when I go down to Durban, which is not, in, not near enough to, to emulate his character. Amen? But beloveds, we need to look around. We need to not only remember the faithful, but we must what? Follow the faithful. Let's read. What do we mean by follow? Second Timothy again, chapter 3, 10, 11, and 14. But thou was fully known, fully known, followed my doctrine. You have fully known or what? Followed my doctrine. Timothy has followed Paul's doctrine. His manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, etc. And then he says in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and that thou hast been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. Not only must we remember the faithful to stand in difficult times, but we must follow and imitate them. Follow and imitate them. There's nothing wrong with that. It's biblical. I will show you in a moment. One Bible scholar says the word known or followed in verse 10 means to follow a person so closely that you are always by the person's side conforming your life to that person. You're so close to this person that you start becoming like that person. That is what I spoke about. I wish I could have more physical interaction with Pastor Derek Finn. More physical interaction so that that which he has can, be, can rub off on me. Amen? Beloved, that's the kind of people you need to be looking for in your life. It was literally used of following a person as he goes somewhere and of walking in his footsteps. That's what the, the word follow means. To literally follow a person wherever that person goes and to walk in that person's footsteps. Timothy wasn't just aware of Paul's example. He had been imitating Paul's example for decades. In addition, other teachers imparted also into Timothy's life, enabling Timothy to stand. We can see this in verse 14 as he calls Timothy to continue in what he had learned because he knew from who he learned it from. So the word who there is plural. It's not meaning Paul only. Timothy learned not only from Paul but also from other people. Amen. Timothy owed a great deal to many teachers who imparted these vital survival tools into him. This is true for us as well. If we are going to stand firm in these terrible times, we need to follow the godly examples of the faithful. Somebody say, follow the faithful. Philippians 3 verse 17. Paul said, brethren, be followers together of me. Be what? Followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as well, so that you have us for an example. Wow. Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church to what? Oh, sorry, the Philippian church to what? To follow him and to follow others who are imitating him. He said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, he says, Be ye followers or imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. No further do you must you imitate me. You only imitate me as far as I imitate Christ. We must keep our eyes on godly people. <laughs> How many times our eyes focus on ungodly people? Ungodly celebrities who hate Christ, who hate the church, and yet we give them an audience. We give them viewership numbers. Come on. You think you're just watching MTV. No, you're giving them viewership numbers. You're increasing their viewership numbers. And all the other filth we watch. But we must keep our eyes on what? Godly people. Godly people. And imitate them if we are going to stand in difficult times. I'm giving you survival tools for these last days. Amen? Amen? And the first is to what? Is to remember the faithful. And secondly is to what? To follow the faithful. Now Satan often uses the same technique of holding up an example. As he seeks to corrupt the world and the church. But instead of godly examples, Satan parades and promotes ungodly examples in the media. If you look at those who get the most attention in our culture, uh, cultures, it's usually ungodly TV stars, actors, musicians, and ungodly athletes with no morality or no conscience. 
Even TV preachers who focus on money, prosperity, but don't preach the word. Satan has also lifted these people up so we can rather keep our eyes on these people rather than godly people. And he will tell you that looking at godly people is boring. <laughs> ah, you're looking at that pastor. That pa pastor life is boring, man. Check that celebrity now. That's the life, baby. Keep your eyes on that. You know, that's what the devil does. He tells you Christianity is boring, man. I mean, right now there are people in the malls. You're sitting in a church. There are people on picnic spots. You're sitting in a church. Christianity is boring, man. Don't keep your eyes on that. The, go, enjoy your life. <laughs> He's trying to shift your eyes from that which is right and wholesome and godly and good for you. Amen? But these celebrities... They are paraded and promoted to affect the culture in a negative manner, leading others into similar pathways. Don't look to our politicians. Don't look to our musicians. Don't look to our athletes. Don't look to our actors if they are not looking to Jesus Christ. And be careful of those who parade or mouth the name of Jesus but their lives speak nothing of that be careful of those deceivers if we are going to survive and stand firm in these last days we must walk closely with the faithful walk closely with the godly come on and follow their footsteps as Timothy did Paul's. Hallelujah. Proverbs 13 verse 20. The Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall himself become wise. I don't want to read the second part because it's irrelevant to what I'm saying. But the second part says, A friend of fools will be destroyed. Come on, are your friends fools? Are your companions foolish people? You will be destroyed. But he who walks with the wise shall himself become wise. It will rub off. Amen? So, beloveds, we must allow the wise to invest in our lives through their examples and their teaching. Amen? Right. Observation question. What are the characteristics of the faithful as demonstrated through Paul's characteristics? That's the question that you need to answer. So, we're going to just look at a few things about the, the characteristics of people who have faithful lives. Number one, the faithful live transparent lives. Somebody say, the faithful live transparent lives. Because you need to now, you need to understand what kind of faithful people are you looking at. How am I going to know that's a faithful person? I can look to that person as an example to follow. Uh, Paul said to Timothy in verse 10, But thou hast fully known and followed my doctrine, my manner of life. You have what? Fully known and followed, or followed what? My manner of life. You know my life. There's nothing that's not hidden to you, Timothy. You've seen every facet of my life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen? You all think Paul never had some bad and some ugly? We'll see in a moment. But as mentioned, it can also be translated to know. Paul says, you've known my doctrine, my teaching, my way of life. The implication is that Paul lived a life of what? Transparency. Everyone could look right through him. Amen? And guess what he did? He invited others to watch. He invited. He says, come on, you've known my life. You've known, you've known it. There was nothing I hid from you. Hallelujah. This wasn't because Paul was perfect. <laughs> Paul wasn't perfect. But he still invited people to watch his life. How do we know Paul wasn't perfect? Because he says it. He says in Romans chapter 7. Verse 19 and onward, you can read it. He says, the things that I wouldn't do, the things that I don't want to do, uh, those things I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. So Paul had a struggle, a personal struggle with the flesh. Amen? So he wasn't perfect. He never claimed to be perfect. And then in Romans chapter 7, I think it's verse 20, 25, or 24, he says, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord who gives us the victory. Amen? So Paul wasn't perfect, but he was what? He was pursuing perfection. 
And we need examples like that. You see, I'm sure you've looked at my life over the years as the pastor of this house and you have seen some imperfections. Come on, be honest. I won't rebuke you. I will actually be happy if you are honest. And you've seen some imperfections. You have seen some shortfalls. You have seen some, some things about my character that you said, really, pastor, can you actually respond, react like that? You're the pastor of, after all. Hey, I'm only human after all. I'm only human, right? Yes, I'm spo- I carry a higher uh, 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 um, a- accountability than you do as a pastor because the Bible says that shepherds must be what? Above reproach. Of course, but that doesn't mean that they are perfect. But if you see the man of God, okay, sorry, yeah, the, the servant of God, if you see him, striving to become perfect then don't look for the niggly loopholes and weaknesses that he has because you have them too but but say say, you know what I know that man's life I know he loves the Lord I know he loves the work of the Lord I know he loves the people of God I know he loves the word of God he's doing everything he can to make sure that we are growing spiritually that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ yes he made a few mistakes yes he said some things that really didn't sit well but I know his heart he loves God and he wants the people of God to serve God with all their hearts that's it And that was Paul. The things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. But what could they see in Paul? A man who's striving to be like Jesus. One of the results of sin is the loss of transparency. One of the results of sin is the loss of transparency. Hear what I'm saying, church. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was their response? They went to hide. You see that? They hid from one another and they hid from God. But the more we come to know Jesus Christ, the more we begin to live in the light and walk in the light as he is in the light light amen according to what first john chapter 1 verse 7 says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have what fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from what all sin so the closer we walk to jesus christ the more we are walking in the light and there is nothing to hide people church sfcc our lives must be open to one another transparent there are people with hidden agendas in the church there are people who talk about other people in the church they have a, a, a they, they have a field day discussing other people in the church it ought not to be so we have backbiters in the church Paul says you devour one another we devour one another. We're cutting Satan's job in half. <laughs> because the Bible says he came to seek who he can. So if we're devouring each other, we are actually cutting Satan's job in half. Stop gossiping. Slandering. Dragging people's names through the mud. Mr. or Miss Perfect. Sure. Not one amen. But all of heaven is saying hallelujah. The angels are singing hallelujah. They agreeing with me. Stop backbiting. Stop gossiping. Stop slandering. You are helping Satan in his effort to divide the church. And destroy it. Control it. A little member can set a forest ablaze. Small matchstick can set a whole forest ablaze. Your tongue is a dangerous weapon. Oh, it can be a blessing. Either way. But there are people who got this snake tongue. 
One side, Ooh, you're such a lovely person. I love you so. Other side, oh, do you know what a horrible person he is? Oh, the snake tongue in the house of the Lord. But anyway, let's not get it too much into that. I think you got the picture, right? Our lives must be what? Transparent. If I have a problem with you, and you or you have a problem with me or an issue, something you didn't like, I didn't greet you, or the way I greeted you, or the way I spoke to you, or the way I answered you, don't go behind my back. Come to me. Talk to me. We, we should be well. Transparent. Brothers and sisters. One family in Jesus. Hey, brother. I greeted you this morning and you looked the other way. Is there something we need to talk about? Oh, no, no, no. I was just in my own, in my own world. Oh, okay. How are you doing? Kla. Eit gesot. No, Kanye. Ye om. Swo om. And I story can swo om. And by the time that I story we have your eight stick, then that story has got it's been remixed. Remixed, was I remixed? It's got a whole new twist to it, new, more exciting nuances to it. Someone spiced it up a little, some aromat, and they, by the time it got back to you, it's like, what did I say that? I didn't say that. Are you with me, beloved? If you have a problem with someone in the church, go to them. Now I'm going to preach probably a part two of this, I know. But I'm just as the Spirit is leading. If you have a problem with someone, what must you do? Go to them. And don't try to keep your macho man and confront them in a crowd. One side. Call them one side. Or make an appointment. Let's go have a coffee, man. Just something I need to talk to you about. Amen? Beloveds, we need to do this because we are cutting Satan's job in half. Let's continue. We are far from perfect, but we follow a perfect God who can use even our imperfections to encourage others who are similarly imperfect. Imagine this pastor did nothing wrong. Nothing. You would always feel what? Inferior to him. I'll never reach that pastor's status of holiness. That pastor never says a nasty word in a nasty way. I've never heard him misbehave. I've never, I've never heard any stories about him. I, man, that pa I'm never going to reach that stage. Now you walk away discouraged. But when you see the pastor's imperfections, you can say, ah, you know what? He's human too. And if he could make that mistake, I could make it as well. There's even more, you know, tenderness toward one another. When we see that kind, when we look at it in that way, there's more tenderness and not judgmental. Because when you think you got it, then you start judging others. You've got to stop. It's got to, you've got to be a true Christian. Sunday to Sunday. Cover to cover. Amen. No pretenses. Be real. Be transparent. Hallelujah. How much time? Okay, so beloveds, while an ungodly example practices hypocrisy and puts on a charade to appear holy, a godly example lives a transparent life which includes both his successes and his failures. You got that? Successes and failures. Christ said this in John 18, 20. Christ I spoke, I've spoken openly or publicly to the world. I've said nothing in secret. He says, I've said nothing in secret. I spoke openly to the world. Jesus lived a transparent life and his message was transparent for all to see and to hear. Amen? Transparent. This is who I am. This is who I am. You will see the good, you'll see the bad, and then you're going to see the downright ugly. Amen? Amen? But know this, and if you do know me, if you do know my heart, if you know my life, 
my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, etc. You will know that I am striving as a shepherd in this house. I'm striving for perfection. Sometimes I come on hard. I come down hard on the family. Why? Because I desire to see you grow with me. It's not because I want a full church. I'm used to empty chairs. I desire those that are here. I desire to grow with me. I don't want to be growing and then you not gr- you there. That is why I'm hard on you sometimes. Like any parent would be on their child who's not studying enough. You know what I'm saying? Not spending enough time with their books. You're hard on them. You take away certain things from them. And you're not getting your phone until you've written that test. And you get 60 or 70%. You know? So we're hard on our children. But there's a reason, right? Because we want them to be successful. Hallelujah. Okay. Question. Are you living a transparent life? Or are you practicing a secret life? Right. Beloved, the second characteristic of the faithful. Second characteristic of the faithful, not only do they live transparent lives, in other words, remember we are told what? To remember the faithful, but also to follow the faithful. So if I'm going to follow you, number one, you must have a transparent life. Don't hide things. Number two, the people that we follow, do they teach God's word? So that's the second characteristic of the faithful. They teach God's word. Paul points to Timothy, what? Timothy, you have known my what? Verse 10, doctrine. You have known my what? Doctrine, my teaching. You have known the things that I teach, the things that I preach. One of Paul's goals was to what? To teach the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, I did not shun to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. A preacher called of God preaches the whole counsel of God. We don't just preach money, 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 money. We preach sin, 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 sin as well. We don't even preach money, but there is a place for preaching on money in the Bible. Stewardship. But what I'm saying is as a preacher, we are called to preach the whole counsel. Genesis to Revelation. The good parts. Those, the parts that make me feel good. The parts that make me feel like a super Christian. And then the parts that make me feel like the rotten, most rotten Christian on the earth. Come on. That's the whole counsel. Amen? It's not just feel good, feel good. At times we have to feel bad about our walk with Christ and get it in order. Amen? That's the purpose of a pastor or a preacher so Paul didn't av- avoid difficult texts he didn't soften down the tone and he didn't change them to not offend the church or the culture no he preached the word of God whether it was popular or whether it was what unpopular Paul soon warns Timothy of how that in the last days instead of preaching the whole counsel of God there would be a plethora that means a large number of false teachers who will stroke the itch of people's ears trying to make them feel good 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 Thank God for this church. Every time I say it, I mean it. Thank God for SFCC. No, we're not perfect. Pastor's not perfect. Worship team's not perfect. Building's not perfect. Sound is not perfect. Ain't nothing, but there's a perfect Christ we serve. We serve a perfect Christ. And we preach the perfect word. And we try to preach the perfect word perfectly. We might mess up a little bit here and there, now and again. I think all preachers do, but the the, the, the point is, we try to stick as straight as possible. To shoot that arrow as straight as possible. Amen? You are in a good church. A healthy Bible teaching church. Amen? I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet here. God knows my heart. But it is true. I look at Facebook. I look around. I hear what the guys are preaching. So thank God you are here. Amen? So this faithful teaching doesn't only refer to a public teaching. 
uh, but also private teaching. These godly models challenge us with God's word when we're in sin. They encourage us uh, when we are down and they affirm us when we are doing what is right. We must follow these kinds of people. We must become these kinds of people. So in this church, not only do we uh, challenge you with the word of God when you are in sin, but we also encourage you when you are down and we also affirm you when you are doing what is right. There must be a balance. Somebody say balance. Whole counsel of God. A lot of preachers just bash, 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 bash. That's all they do to the people. They just whip the people every Sunday. You rotten sinners. You disgust me. Pastor speaking to the congregation, to God's flock. And that's all they do. Then there are those who only preach love. 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 There must be a balance. Preacher, are you going to be a preacher of the gospel one day? Balance. Amen? So beloved, here's my question. Are you studying God's word so as to teach it to others? Another characteristic of the faithful, I'll close with this one. The faithful practice what they preach. How will you know that you are looking to the right person to follow? Remember him. Remember the faithful? Follow the faithful. Transparency. Teach the word. Practice what you preach. Paul said to Timothy in verse 10, again, verse 10, you have known my way of life. There are many who are orthodox in their doctrine. That means they, they, you know, they're hardcore, hardcore gospel Bible preachers. They stick to the word. They're orthodox in their doctrine, but they are unorthodox with their life. They don't practice what they preach. It's a visible hypocrisy and it only serves to push people away from God. Timothy was keenly aware of how Paul used his time. Paul used his time. How Paul used his recreation. How Paul uh, 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 used his work life, his devotion, his prayer life and even his ministry. Timothy was well aware of everything concerning Paul's life. And Paul indeed practiced what he preached. All of that was open before Timothy and all of it matched what Paul taught. We must model these types of people to survive in these last days. I want to look at someone who when he preaches and I see him in the week, even if he knows I'm not looking, he's still the same guy who stands behind that pulpit on a Sunday. It's the kind of person I want to follow. Amen.